uncomfortable, it makes it difficult to hear. But I also think that it's good training because how many of you realize that sometimes you'll be put into situations where your flesh isn't comfortable and you're being pressed from all sides and how important is it then to hear from Yahweh? And so I found that it's quite important that we learn to hear despite our circumstances. That we learn to hear despite what we may be feeling in our flesh because if we can't hear from Yahweh then we may miss something and it may determine the course and the outcome of our situation. And I believe that that's exactly what this Torah portion is dealing with. And if you've been reading through, you know we're in the book of Deuteronomy. And to be quite honest, Deuteronomy can be a hard book to study. It's written differently, it seems, than the other books of the Torah. And when you begin to try and delve into it, there's just such, it seems like you, as if you hit a wall, but there's some things that are hidden here if you're not just a casual observer and you're willing to dig and to tune your ear into Yahweh, I believe he wants to show his people some things that's going to change our situations. It's going to change some things that we're facing. How many of you may be going through a situation right now in your life that you need to hear from Yahweh? That you've got a situation that you need him to intervene. You need to know that he's heard your cry and that he's already sent his word to answer it. And that's exactly what this Torah portion is about. It's all about learning to petition Yahweh in such a way that you're guaranteed that you've got his attention, that he hears. It's all about learning where you stand in covenant and how to interact and come before him. The title of this week's Torah portion is Bayet Kanan. Say that with me. Bayet Kanan. See, Hebrew is not that hard. It covers Deuteronomy chapter 3, verse 27, through chapter 7, verse 11. And if you were here last week, then you already know that it's all about words. Words, words, words. words. And I have to say, if you didn't get it last week, then you're bound to get it this week. Because the whole book is all about your words. You can't get away from it. No matter what angle you try to approach it from, it has everything to do with us learning the power of our words and learning how to speak His word. And we find that this Torah portion begins to pick up. It's during Moshe's final speech to the children of Israel. How many of you know the setting? They're here. They're camped on this side of the Jordan, and they're preparing to cross over. They've wandered in the wilderness for 40 years, and all of the first generation has finally died off. And now we find that it's time to cross the border. It's time to go across the Jordan and go and take their inheritance and deal with the enemies that have set up in the camp in Israel, in the land. And we find that Moshe is beginning to instruct the children of Israel here at this final location before he leaves them. And it's his final speech. And we find that as we read it in the English, it's almost as if it's, he's encouraging them. He's trying to pump them up to get them ready as they go into the land. But I thought it was quite interesting because you'll notice there's several key Scripture, several key commandments that are taking place during this speech. We find that as Moses begins to speak to the children of Israel, he repeats the Ten Commandments. We see it's here in Deuteronomy that we see the Shema, hear, O Israel. It's one of the most repeated prayers in the believing community. And not only that, he begins to cover and give a discourse on some other very key commandments. And so as we begin to look at this, it seems as well, maybe if he's covering all this really important material, then maybe there's a little bit more going on here. Maybe it's not just a speech to encourage and pump up Israel, but there's something that he's trying to convey to them that's going to affect the outcome when they go into the land. Yes. In fact, our first clues here come with the setting and the material that he's addressing. It was interesting to me that when you begin to look at this, I found that the Ten Commandments are only listed in their entirety, in their order, in their fullness, 1 through 10, in Exodus chapter 20, when they're first given at Mount Sinai, and here in this Torah portion in Deuteronomy at Mount Pisgah. It's the only two passages in the scriptures where you see them. You see them referenced a lot. You see them summarized. But it's only here in Exodus 20 that you see them laid out from the beginning to the end. And once again, it's a mountain experience. And we understand that as we look at this, we know that these Ten Commandments, these words that were being spoken, this was the foundation of the covenant that Israel had with Yahweh. It was the wedding terms. It was the vows. This was their ketubah. This was the promises that Yahweh was giving to them. And we find then that if this is the case, then it seems that instead of just an encouraging speech to Israel, 
that what's taking place here at this encounter, at this location, it has to do with the legal covenant terms being reiterated. It has to do with the covenant cutting ceremony. Israel's being prepared to enter into the land. And the last thing that they're being reminded of is you need to know the terms of the covenant. You've got to know where you stand. You've got to know your covenantal rights. Because when you go into the land, you're going to have to deal with the enemy. You can't do it based on your own flesh. You can't do it based on your emotions. And you can't do it based on what you think. He's reminding that if you're going to be victorious, it's going to be because you understand your covenant. You understand your rights. You understand the terms. And that's going to affect the outcome of the battle. How many realize the same can be said of any situation that you may be going through? There's some covenantal terms. There's some boundary lines. And if we don't understand this, then it's affecting our situation. If we don't know how to properly speak his word and we don't understand our rights, then it begins to affect the way we do battle. It begins to affect whether we're victorious or not. Yeah. Now let's look at this passage in Deuteronomy chapter 3, verse 23. We're going to look at just a few of these verses. And we're going to get a running start just to see what's taking place. And in the English we read here, it starts off this Torah portion. It says, And I besought Yahweh at that time, saying, O Yahweh Elohim, thou hast begun to show thy servant thy greatness and thy mighty hand. For what Elohim is there in heaven or in earth that can do according to thy works and according to thy might? I pray thee, let me go over and see the good land that is beyond Jordan, that goodly mountain in Lebanon. But Yahweh was wroth with me for your sakes, and would not hear me. And Yahweh said unto me, Let it suffice thee, speak no more unto me of this matter. Get thee up into the top of Pisgah, and lift up thine eyes westward and northward and southward and eastward, and behold it with your eyes, for you shall not go over this Jordan. And if you continue to read the next verse, we find that instead we're reminded that it will be Joshua that's going to lead the children of Israel over across the Jordan. And before he begins to really launch into his speech, the statement's made, so we abode in the valley over against Beth Peor. And if you read the whole Torah portion, it almost seems that this first little section, this chunk of chapter 3, as if it's just kind of a parenthetical statement. It's an aside. Moses is begging Yahweh to enter into the promised land, but no, the answer is no. And so now he goes on to finish speaking with the children of Israel, going into the covenantal terms. And so we really don't pay attention to exactly what's happening here. But you'll find that when you begin to dig into the Hebrew, something very different is taking place. In the English, it looks as if, Yahweh, if Moses is begging Yahweh to be allowed into the land. It's something that most of us are most likely familiar with. A lot of us have a tendency to beg Yahweh. But yet you're going to see in this Torah portion, he's about to teach you the proper way to approach him, the proper way to beseech him. So we're going to look at this phrase. It says, and I pleaded or and I besought. In the Hebrew, it's the word va'et kanan, and it's where we get the name of this Torah portion. It comes from the root kanan, which means to be gracious, to show favor, or to pity. But the interesting thing is that it's connected to the word kana, which means to encamp, to set oneself down. It has the idea of pitching a tent, to decline, to bow down, to settle somewhere. And when you look at the way this word is conjugated in the Hebrew language, it's translated into the English as, and I pleaded, and immediately we think it's Moshe. Moshe is begging. Moshe is pleading Yahweh, but that's not what it says in the Hebrew language. Amen. Instead, it's the letter Vav, Aleph, Tav. The letter Vav in Hebrew means and. And the Aleph, Tav, Basalt. And the Aleph, Tav, Canaan. And the Aleph, Tav, Show Favor. We understand the Aleph, Tav, in the book of Revelation, the Messiah makes the statement, I'm the beginning and the end, I'm the first and the last. And in the Greek, it's translated as I'm the Alpha and the Omega, but it was the Hebrew rendition of the Aleph and Tav. And so now, if this is the case, this phrase, va'et kanan, literally makes the statement, and the olive tav, the Messiah was gracious, showed favor, or pleaded. And now, if we look at it that way, my goodness, doesn't that change the whole discourse? It changes everything about this paragraph right here. It changes everything about what's taking place. Because it's not Moshe begging to enter the promised land, but there's something else happening. The olive tav is pleading. The olive tav is kanan. 
And when we plug in the rest of this meaning, as it begins to change the tone, it seems to infer that it's the olive tav, the Messiah that has chana. Remember, it means to settle, to sit down, to begin to dwell. In other words, it seems to be inferring that it's the olive tav that is now dwelling in the camp of Israel. He's settled down. He's made camp in the midst of them as they're gathered here before this mountain. And it seems that once again, Israel's being gathered before him and they're going to be inspected just like they were at Mount Sinai when they first heard the ten words, when they first heard the terms of the covenant. And once again, they're being gathered before him and they're being inspected to see if they're going to gain his favor, if they're going to receive grace in his sight. In other words, a verdict's about to be issued concerning Israel's right to their inheritance. Because that's what this whole discourse is about. They're waiting to cross into the land. They're waiting to take hold of the promises that Yahweh has for them. And we find that before they cross that border, the olive tom shows up. And it's as if Israel now, they're being weighed in the balance. And he's about to declare the verdict of whether or not they're going to have access to those promises. He's about to make the declaration of whether or not their inheritance is going to be grasped by them. How many of you feel like maybe you're in a situation where you're also being weighed in the balance? And it seems that there's some promises. There's an inheritance that Yahweh's promised for you, and it's right there. You can see it. It's right across the Jordan. There it is. It's so close you can almost touch it. You can smell it. It's right there, but yet it's just out of reach. And it seems that maybe that this is what's taking place. He's trying to get us to understand. We're being weighed in the balance. And the olive top, the Messiah himself, is looking and he's inspecting. And he's about to make a declaration of whether or not that's your inheritance. Of whether or not those promises are going to be gotten by you. Now if we break apart this word kanan in Hebrew to show favor or grace. Which, by the way, grace has become such a watered-down term that we really don't understand the significance. It becomes synonymous with mercy now in our vocabulary. Mercy is unmerited. Mercy is Yahweh when even though we don't deserve it, He extends His mercy. And yet grace is something different. Grace, when we look at the first time it's used, it's used in reference to Noah. And it deals with Noah being an upright, righteous individual. Grace is the result of being obedient to the covenant. He gives you favor. He renders the verdict in your favor because you've been obedient to keep the terms. And we find that this is what Israel's approaching, asking him for. They're not asking for mercy. It's about getting his favor. In other words, they're asking him to look at their walk. Look at the way they've carried themselves. How have they handled the covenant terms? And based on that, will they receive his favor? Now, if we break apart this word, Canaan, it begins to reveal what Israel is going to be inspected about, what he's looking at, exactly what they're being weighed in the balance concerning. Wouldn't you like to know maybe what you're being weighed in the balance concerning? Yes. It would make it a lot easier to make sure we were right. It would be a lot easier to narrow this down and make sure we've got these areas lining up and that we're doing and handling these, these things properly. The letter Ket Nun is the root of this word Kanan. The letter Ket means to fence, a hedge, a boundary line. The letter Nun in Hebrew, because every single letter has a picture, has a definition, it represents word or seed. So we find that when he sits down and he's about to inspect Israel, he's about to render a verdict, that what he's inspecting them concerning is how they've handled the boundary lines of the word, how they've handled the boundary lines of the Torah that's been entrusted to them. And so the same question we find today can be asked of you now, how have we handled these boundary lines? How have we walked this out? How have we handled his word? And we find that it's interesting because when you begin to look at this, this same root stem, this ket nun, it's the same root that's seen in the word kanak. It's the root of the word Hanukkah. It means to train, to dedicate. It has the sense of training up a child, but the interesting thing is that it can mean to put something in your mouth, to taste it. And to taste becomes the analogy that if you've tasted something, you understand it. 
In other words, to be trained, to be dedicated in the way that you've handled it, you're familiar with it, you know how this operates, you know how to use it, you understand this in and out. So we find here that as Israel's gathered, it seems that the Hebrews are inferring that they've spent the last 40 years being kanat. They've spent the last 40 years being trained, dedicated, honing their understanding concerning the covenant, concerning his word. And now we find that it's time for them to be inspected concerning that word that he's placed in their mouth. And before they cross over, this is what is being weighed in the balance. Do they understand his word? For the past 40 years, they've been in the midbar, the place where the promised word's being spoken. For the past 40 years, he's led them, and he's placed this into their mouth. And now we see that the line's being, being drawn in the sand. Now it's do or die. And we have to ask, why is it so important that before they cross into the land that he's concerned with whether or not they know the word? Would you think that maybe because of our understanding of his word, that's what's going to determine the outcome of the battle? Do you think that maybe it's our own words that we've been declaring that are affecting our situations? And that before Israel crosses over and they go into the land, he's trying to remind them, be careful of the words that you speak. Yes. You need to understand that you should be speaking the word that I placed in your mouth. And when we begin to speak something else, it causes that situation to be affected as well. We need to speak his word. If you're going to be victorious, if you're going to get the promises and the inheritance that the enemy's trying to steal from you, it's going to be because you've learned to speak his word that he's placed in your mouth. Amen? Now as we continue to break down this term of Vayet Kanan, if you look at it, the Va prefix means and, and technically you could say that the Aleph prefix means I, and I pleaded. Well, then you're left with the Tav, Ket, Nun, He root, Sakina. It's a seldom used word that predominantly occurs only when King Solomon's dedicating the temple in 1 Kings and 2 Chronicles. And it's interesting because when you begin to look at this word that's connected to Vayet Kanan, Sakina, it has the same root that this word Tekina is often translated as supplication. And we find that throughout the whole dedication of the temple later, Solomon constantly makes the statement that his supplication is being offered up to Yahweh as he's dedicating this temple. And he's asking Yahweh that as the people would come to the temple to pray that Yahweh would hear them, that he would hear their supplication, that he would hear their sakina, and that he would maintain their cause. And you'll find it repeated numerous times throughout these two different chapters where the temple's being dedicated. And when you begin to look at the usage and the way it's used, you'll find that it's legal terminology. This is dealing, this is covenant terms. And you'll notice that Deuteronomy, he's using a lot of the same terminology. Why? Because he's trying to teach you this is a legal case. You're coming before the judge and you're petitioning him on your behalf so that you can have access to your inheritance and the enemy's trying to steal from you. But if you come before the judge and you don't know the proper protocol when you come into the courtroom, you may not get a favorable outcome. And so we find that as we begin to look at this, he's trying to teach Israel, you've got to understand your covenant rights. You've got to understand the process and how this works. And we find that here the olive top is about to sit in judgment over Israel concerning whether or not they're ready to enter in and take back their inheritance. And if we fast forward to our day, we find that we as well have been cast out of our inheritance. We've been scattered. It's been lost to us. We've been cut off. And yet now we're waking up and we're beginning to once again petition Yahweh for our inheritance. We're petitioning him. We're crying out to him. And we find this same message now begins to apply. Once we petition him, the all of time is going to sit in judgment concerning our inheritance. But before we do that, he's trying to remind us we've got to understand. We have to make sure we know the covenant terms. How many of you currently happen to be going through situations where it seems as if your promises, your inheritance, it's being contested? It seems as if the enemy's doing everything he can do to steal, kill, and destroy. 
whether it be your health, whether it be your finances, whether it be in your household, in your family, no matter what, it seems as if it's from every direction, it's this all-out attack. And I found that once you go through this and you're walking through this and it becomes this prolonged battle, we begin to question whether or not he's hearing, don't we? We begin to wonder, well, Yahweh, my goodness, have you even heard what I've been saying? Have you heard my supplications? Have you heard my petitions? And I found that when you begin to study this chapter here in 1 Kings and here in Deuteronomy, it's laying out the blueprint and he's letting you know that this is the proper protocol. And if you'll go through these steps, he's promising that he'll hear. He's promising that he will listen. He'll lend his ear to your tahina, to your supplications. He's teaching you how to properly litigate your case. In fact, the statement there is made in 1 Kings in addition to Solomon offering up the supplications of the people, the statement is made that Yahweh will hear it, and then the statement is made that he'll maintain their cause. When they offer up this supplication to him, when they cry out to him, he promises that he will maintain their cause. Hallelujah. Well, let's look at that word, cause. It's the word mishpat in Hebrew. It's funny because it's the same term used countless times talking about the judgments, the commandments of Yahweh. He's going to uphold his commandments. He's going to uphold his covenantal promises. That means that if you understand what your covenant promises are and you understand that you've been walking these you've been walking in between these set boundary lines and then when you begin to petition him, he's promising you, I'm going to uphold what I said I would. Amen. And so now you can begin to understand it's waging war from a totally different perspective. Because you know your position. You know you're making a stand in covenant. And you know that you can boldly proclaim because it's his word that you're standing on, not your own. Amen. The word mishpat means judgment, justice, and ordinance. It can also mean to plead anyone's cause or to be his patron. The interesting thing, though, when I began to look at this word this morning, if you notice, the two-letter root is the sheen pay of this term mishpat, directly in the middle. The sheen in Hebrew is the picture representing fire. It means to change something, to purge it, specifically to purge it via fire. And then you have the letter pay, which represents your mouth and the words that proceed forth out of your mouth. So once again, he begins to connect this together. This whole passage is dealing with us learning to train our mouths to speak his word. It's all about learning to purge these lips, to take the cold, cleanse my lips. Here I am. And it's learning to begin to change the words that would come out of our mouth because now we can begin to understand that if we'll change the words that are coming out of our mouth, and if we'll begin to declare his word, that's what's going to cause our sakina, our supplications, to be heard. And in fact, it will cause the olive top, the Messiah, to step in and be the patron. Be the one that will plead your cause. Because when you begin to declare his word into the situation, guess what? He will show up. Amen? Amen? Amen. <laughs> and so we find that the proper way to petition him is by declaring what his word says about our situation. Do you realize that when we begin to murmur and complain when things don't go our way, and we begin to whine and to beg and to plead, how quickly does he move? Ooh, not very. The children of Israel had a hard time learning this lesson. In the wilderness, when things didn't go their way, the first thing they did, they didn't declare, Yahweh, you said that you were going to meet our needs. You said that you were bringing us out of Egypt, that you were bringing us to the promised land. You made a covenant with us. That's not the words that came out of their mouth. Instead, the words that came out of their mouth was, did you bring us out here to die? Yeah. It'd be better in Egypt. At least we had food. Yeah. It wasn't that bad. At least we weren't wandering around in the desert. And yet we find that he's constantly attempting to remind them that if they'll stand and declare his word, what his word says about their situation, standing on their covenantal promises, that's what's going to change things. Yes, amen. 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 <coughs> now, in response to Solomon's supplications there in 1 Kings, his sakina, concerning Yahweh hearing not only his but also the people's prayers, we find that Yahweh answers in 1 Kings chapter 9, verse 3. And really, we don't have the time this morning.
morning, but it would be in your best interest to go back and read that whole chapter when the temple is being dedicated, and then go back and read this Torah portion in Deuteronomy. You'll find some of the exact same phrases repeated in both instances. The same consequences when they don't keep the covenant, and the same promises if they do. Because it's the same thing happening. Solomon was entering into a legal discussion concerning the promises of Yahweh, just like Moshe and the children of Israel, Israel are here in this Torah portion. In 1 Kings chapter 9, verse 3, Yahweh responds to him and he says, And Yahweh said unto him, I have heard thy prayer and thy supplication that thou hast made before me. I have hallowed this house which thou hast built to put my name there forever, and mine eyes and my heart shall be there perpetually. And when I saw that, I thought, my goodness, he's talking about a physical temple, a physical house that was built. But we understand that it wasn't about that physical house. That was a picture. That was a teaching tool. This was the temple. This was the house. This was the dwelling place. And here we find if we backtrack in Deuteronomy, it's that temple that's standing before Yahweh, petitioning him to place his name upon them. Yes. The children of Israel are gathered, the temple that's not made with human hands. And we find they're petitioning Yahweh to consecrate them, to hallow them, to set them apart for a specific purpose. And that purpose is to have his name placed upon them. Remember, he's reiterating the Ten Commandments, these ten words. Well, those ten commandments, those ten words, it's the ketubah, it's the wedding vows. So when they declare all that you said we will do, his name is being placed on them. They're now taking on his name. And we find that as they agree to the terms of this covenant and they begin to walk in it, he's acknowledging and letting them know that Yahweh will hear them. He's letting them know that Yahweh will see them and that his heart will always be with them. And we find that the whole plan, though, is that this is all depending upon them being willing, willing to become trained and to teach their mouths to proclaim his word. Them being willing to handle it properly. Because if they couldn't handle the covenant properly, if they couldn't handle the written and the spoken word properly, how would they ever be able to handle the living word properly when he arrived as their husband? So we find that this whole passage, as Moshe begins to speak to the children of Israel, he's reminding them that they have covenantal rights. They've agreed to the terms of this contract, and that means that as they go into the land, and they're going to be faced with this opposition, that Yahweh's going to hear their prayers. And they're being reminded that it's his word that has the ability to change their situations if they'll train their mouth to begin to declare it. As we continue to look, Supplication and prayer, you'll find in 1 Kings, are always going hand in hand. And it seems as if it's the same concept in English, but it's two different words in the Hebrew. And this is, quite honest, a concept that we really haven't understood. We think we know how to pray. We think we know how to petition Yahweh. And yet when I begin to look at this in Hebrew, I look at prayer different, differently now. Because the definition of prayer from the Hebrew perspective, you'll think twice before you begin to pray about something. And it's not that we beg until we get what we want. It's not like a genie and it just immediately, yep, the answer is yes, it's yours. That's not the way this works. In Hebrew, the word prayer is tefillah. And it means prayer, intercession, and entreaty. It's from the root, though, palal, and it means to intervene, to interpose, to pray, but it has the sense of judging. It has the sense of a cutting that's taking place, and it means to break. In fact, the roots of this word literally paints the picture of a steamroller that would roll over something and make it even. And so we find that when you begin to look at the Hebrew definition of the word prayer, when you begin to pray regarding a situation, what you've just done is you've told Yahweh and you've given him the right to come down and to judge in your situation. And so now you can understand why maybe we better think twice. Because before we ask him to come down, we might want to make sure that we've done what we've been supposed to be doing. 
that we're walking this out like we're supposed to. We might want to make sure that we get all our ducks in a row before we say, okay, Yahweh, judge this house. Judge this situation. And so we find that when we're praying, we ask Yahweh to sit in judgment of our situation. And it's no accident that this word, palal and tefillah, it's connected with the idea of a cutting that's taking place, of a breaking that must happen. And now you can begin to understand that sometimes we've been petitioning Yahweh and we've been praying about it concerning situations and nothing's changed. And it seems as if he's just not hearing. And yet when you begin to understand the whole concept of prayer, now you can begin to understand that maybe the reason the situation's not changing is because you're in that situation because there's a further cutting process that has to take place. In other words, there's a circumcision of the heart that you're going through. In other words, there's a breaking process. You're a vessel, and occasionally we have to be put on the wheel of the potter because the potter knows best. And we find that when we begin to pray and petition him, what's happening is you're acknowledging that not my will, but your will be done. You're asking Yahweh to judge in your situation, and you're acknowledging that if I need further circumcision of the heart, if I need a further breaking, if this vessel's not what it's supposed to be, and it's not being used the way it's supposed to be, put me on the wheel. Break me. Amen. If you look, you may begin to ask, why? Why must we go through the breaking process? Why is it so important that we go through this process? Because it's painful. It hurts. It doesn't feel good. My goodness, how much more can we take is what some of us think sometimes. And yet, when you begin to break down this word to feel it, he's showing you why you're going through what you're going through. He's showing you the purpose of being on the potter's wheel, the purpose of going through this painful process, this circumcision of the heart. To feel it, the first three letters form Tav, Pei, Lamed. It forms the word to fell, which means whitewash. It refers to a cheap and deceptive paint like liquid used to whiten and cover unsightly walls, or it can refer to untempered mortar. The lack of a process wherein the mortar is both strengthened and beautified, giving it the proper hardness, the proper smoothness, and the proper consistency. In other words, when you're put into these situations, and it seems that you're having to go through this process where you're in the midst of the fire and things are being burnt up, when you're on the potter's wood, things are being knocked off and it feels as if you're being broken and crushed. He's reminding you that he's put you in this situation because without it, you won't have the proper consistency. You won't have the proper hardness that you should have. You won't have the strength that you need to go through the things that are ahead of you. You'll be whitewashed. It'll be a cheap cover over something underneath that's not what it's supposed to be. And so we find that he's reminding us that if we're never put into a situation where we have to learn to stand on his word, then we become just like that untempered mortar. We're not strengthened. We don't have the right consistency. But he lets us know that if you'll allow him as the great potter, the one that knows how this vessel is intended to look like, if you'll allow him to take you through the process of the shaping and the molding and occasionally having something broken off, occasionally going through that cutting process. If you allow him to take you through the process of being heated so that you become hardened and strengthened, that when the time comes when you need to be able to stand, you won't have a cheap, whitewashed faith. Amen? And I found that it's really easy when everything's going our way to say, yep, I believe in him, I trust you, because all your needs are being met. So really, how much faith does it take? Not a lot. And you'll find that if you never go through this process where you're being hardened gradually, where you're being strengthened gradually, where he's gradually turning up the heat and shaping you, that when you're automatically thrown into a situation like the children of Israel are going to be in the promised land having to deal with the enemy, that you're going to crumble. But because he sees, he gradually begins to take you through this process. He begins to train you, to hone you, to shape you, so that then when finally you get to that place where you're about to deal with the enemy and take back your inheritance, you've got the strength, you've got the know-how, and you've got the faith to do it. 
So now we can begin to look at our situations maybe a little bit differently. Maybe now we can understand the reason we're going through this is because Yahweh's got plans for you and you're going to need to have this faith and you're going to need to know that you know that he's much more than able. So as we continue to look at this, we find that as we begin to pray regarding a situation, when we begin to beseech him regarding our situations, what he's trying to teach us is that if we've been obedient to walk in his covenant, if we've been obedient to handle this properly, and these are our boundary lines that's teaching us and leading and guiding us, then you can be confident when you offer up your prayers. You can be confident that you're going to receive his favor, his grace, his canon. Why? Because you've operated within your covenantal rights. Because you've already declared not my will, but your will be done. And so you know that whatever the outcome is, you're going to receive his favor. It's no accident that in the very next verse in 1 Kings, Israel's reminded they must walk in integrity and keep the commandments. And we find the same thing is happening in the speech that Moshe is giving the children of Israel. In chapter 4, he spends almost the entire chapter constantly reminding them, do the commandments that I'm teaching you today. Learn them. Do them, guard them, keep them, and if you do so, then you're going to live long in the inheritance that Yahweh has for you. And we find that the reason he's putting emphasis on this is because it's his word, this covenant that they're being given that's sharper than any two-edged sword, and it's going to cause their hearts to be circumcised. It's going to cause their mouths, the words, to be changed. And that way, when they're put into these situations, they'll understand what their covenant promises are. They'll understand what their rights are. And they can know beyond a shadow of a doubt that Yahweh has promised to hear. And that there's one that's going to step in on their behalf. Now further inspection of this word, Vayet Kanan, now becomes necessary. Because now we understand Israel's being weighed in the process. Weighed in the balances, so to speak. We find that he's looking to see exactly what they've done with these covenantal promises that they said they would keep. He's looking to see how well they've stayed in the boundary lines that they've been given. Or did they veer off way over here in left field? And the interesting thing is that we're reminded several times in several different formats of their failure to do this. Because he reminds you in this tour portion that they didn't do it in the incident with Baal Peor which happens to have happened at this same general location. In fact, in verse 29 of chapter 3, he reminds them of where they're dwelling at. They're dwelling at Beth Peor, the house of the, or the temple of Peor, this pagan god that they just recently broke these covenantal vows with. If you look at this term, Bayet Canaan, you'll find that it has the root of, the olive tav new noon can be seen. It's the word ethnon, and it means the price or the hire of a prostitute, the gain of a harlot. And it's no accident, as we said, that emphasis is being placed on the fact that Israel has played the harlot directly before they got to this location. The emphasis is being put on that they've accepted the gain of a harlot. They're in Beth Peor. They're in the house of Peor. And they prostituted themselves. Back in Numbers chapter 25, we find that it was a devastating blow to the house of Israel. And that many are cut off because they didn't understand. They didn't keep the boundary lines. The covenant terms have been broken. And this isn't dealing with the generation that's already being cut off. This is dealing with the generation that's supposed to be being raised up and brought into the land. So the previous generation's already out of the way, and now we find the next generation that this is their calling, this is what they're supposed to do, messing it up again. And so then we have to ask the question, as the olive top, as the Messiah is sitting here about to judge their situation, about to declare whether or not they have the right to enter into his land, Moshe is reminding them, remember what just happened not, you know, a few days back when we broke the terms of the covenant. So the question becomes, how can they be restored? How can we cross that boundary line? How can we have his favor extended to us when we've broken it? We haven't kept it. Well, let's look a little closer. 
Beit Peor is mentioned as where they're camping and where they're located. And in the English, it just seems that it's another location. One of the many stops they make in the wilderness before they go into the promised land. But we understand that these names have meaning. It's a prophetical declaration over this location. Beit Peor is translated as the house of Peor, but it comes from the root Peor, which means a cleft. If you break it down, it's spelled Pei, Ayan, Bob, Rach. The letter Pei represents the mouth, words. The Ayan, Bob, Rach root is translated as meaning skins or covering. We see it in Genesis when Yahweh gives the coat of skins to Adam and Eve to cover them. But this same root can also mean to expose something or to be uncovered, a blessing or a curse, to have a proper covering or to be exposed. If you continue to look, you'll find that peor comes from the root pa'ar, and it means to open wide, to gape. It can mean in a jeering or mocking sense, but once again, there's a blessed and a curse meaning. Because it can also mean to praise, to accept someone, to pant and to long after the commandments of Yahweh. So when we see this statement being made, they're camped at Beit Peor, this location was reminding them that their words would act either as a covering of protection for them, or their words would be the means by which they were exposed and uncovered. It would be the words that came forth out of their mouth that would determine the outcome of the situation they were in. Just because they were encamped in Beit Peor did not mean that they had to be uncovered and exposed. It was their own words that caused them to be put into that position, into that position and to be compromised. We find that Israel's words up until this point had mocked the covenant and had opened them up to further compromisation by the enemy. Where if the words of their mouth had been the commandments that they had been declaring the word of Yahweh, then in the midst of the house of Peor, they would have had a covering. They would have had a hedge of protection. They would have had this fence around them, and they wouldn't have been compromised because they would have stayed in the boundary lines, and the word that was being declared out of their mouth would have been sure that they were in the boundary lines. Yet the words of their mouth exposed them and caused them to be uncovered. It's interesting because in chapter 4, he begins to expound a little bit on this location. And we're told that this is the location of the Amorites. Well, that doesn't mean much to us until you look at who the Amorites are and what their name means. The Amorites comes from the root in Hebrew, Imori, and it means a sayer, one who speaks. They're in the location of the ones that understand the words of the mouth and how powerful they are. They're in the location of the people and the individuals that understand how to use their words to uncover, to compromise, and to destroy. It comes from the root amar, meaning to say, to speak, to utter. And we're told that there's two Amorite kings that Israel has to deal with in this location. It was Og and Sihon. It's no accident that when you study these two individuals, they were both giants. They were Nephilim. It was a taste of what Israel was going to have to deal with when they crossed the Jordan and went into the Promised Land. And if they couldn't deal with the Sayers, if they couldn't deal with Og and Sion and those that understood how to use their words, then how could they ever cross the Jordan and go and deal with the rest of them? So we find this location actually becomes a test for Israel just to see how well prepared are they. And we find that they begin to deal with an enemy that understands the power of words. And so Israel's being reminded the whole time they're encamped in this location that it's in their best interest to make sure that their words are not exposing them. To understand that power is in the tongue. And then they begin to understand that their words, that their supplications, that their tekina, if they would be proclaiming the word of Yahweh, that Yahweh had promised to hear them. That they would be protected, they would be within the boundary lines. But if they allow their words to be speaking something else, their words are going to expose them. And so we find that if they can't deal with the Amorites, how can they cross the Jordan and deal with the rest of them? How many of you realize that all of us in here and all of us listening, they, that we have sayers that speak into our life? 
When you're in a given situation, how many times when things aren't going your way, as if it's not bad enough, someone has to come along and tell you how bad it is. Someone has to come along and let you know, you thought it was bad, well let me tell you. And they speak into our life, just like the Amorites, they speak. And words are seed, and that seed gets planted in our life, and if we don't deal with it, if we don't deal with the saves, it affects the situation. A harvest comes up, and the situation does get worse because more seed keeps getting planted. So this harvest keeps going on and on and on, and it's even, where's the end of this? Cut the seed off. Deal with the sayers. We find, though, that a lot of times we're not willing to deal with the sayers, the other individuals that are speaking into our life because our own words are no better. We find that the sayers, everything they're saying, if we'll rewind and begin to think back, what were our own words, if not the same? And so we find that Yahweh's beginning to challenge the children of Israel, and he's beginning to challenge you and I today. We've got to learn to deal with the Amorites. You'll never receive your inheritance. You'll never receive your promises if you don't understand and begin to learn. We've got to watch the words that come out of our mouth. We've got to learn to deal with the words that are spoken into our life. We've got to become aggressive with this and understand that seed that's being planted, that's a harvest that I don't want. And I refuse to allow that seed to be planted in this house. In fact, when we backtrack, we find the Amorites are the reason given for Israel being absent from the land for the past 400 years. When the covenant's cut with Abraham and he's promised this land is his inheritance, we're told in Genesis chapter 15, verse 16, but in the fourth generation they shall come hither again, talking about the descendants of Abraham, Israel, for the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet full. The iniquity of the sayers, those who speak, is not quite finished. It's interesting because later he goes on and he references all the other giant nations that would be in the land that Israel was going to have to deal with, but here in this statement he singles out the Amorites. The focus is on Israel's going to have to know how to deal with those that understand the power of words. The emphasis is on the sayers. We find that Israel can in no way be victorious against the enemies in the land if they aren't willing to circumcise their own lips first. And to begin to understand that their words that they're speaking for, that's what Yahweh's hearing. Their words will affect their covering. Their words will determine the outcome of their case. Their words will affect the outcome of the battle. And we find the same thing is true for you and I today. No matter what the promise is, no matter what the inheritance is, if you're battling for it, you're going to have to deal with the sayers. You're going to have to deal with those that would speak, and you're going to have to deal with your own mouth. We're going to have to learn to speak the word of Yahweh and understand that if his word said it, it's going to be done. <laughs> we understand that Yeshua set the example of how to deal with the sayer in the wilderness. Isn't it interesting? He goes through the exact same experience just to prove to you it can be done. He goes into the wilderness for 40 days. He doesn't take him 40 years to get this right. He can take care of it. He learns the lessons. He demonstrates this in 40 days. And we find that the enemy arrives on the scene, and when Yeshua is weakened in his flesh, fasting and praying for 40 days in the wilderness, at a point in time when you really don't feel like having to deal with somebody, here comes the enemy. And he begins to speak to him, and he twists the words of Yahweh, and he attempts to compromise him. And how does Yeshua respond? It is written. He responds with the word, and guess what? It shuts up the sayer. It shuts up the enemy. See, we've been trying to handle it a little differently. We have a tendency to beg him to go. We have a tendency to run and hide and be quiet. Maybe if we just don't say anything and we go over here in the corner and we let him have all that and we don't mess with him and don't rock the boat, then maybe he'll get tired and leave and go on somewhere else. And yet we find that 40 years pass and we're still in the same situation. Look out. And so we find that what he's trying to teach you is that if you'll learn to speak the word, it is written, it will shut the sayers up. And you'll have to sometimes, occasionally, we've got to learn to say it to ourselves. Because sometimes our flesh begins to cry out and say things that it doesn't need to be saying. And if we'll remind ourselves, no flesh, it is written. And then we can begin to understand, I'm standing on these covenants of promises, and whether you feel like it or not, this is how it's going to be. Your flesh will shut up too. 
Amen? <laughs> now let's look at this word iniquity. It says that the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet full. The word iniquity is avon, and it means perversity, depravity, iniquity. It strongly indicates the idea of twisting or perverting something deliberately. In other words, it's not by accident that they twisted these words. It wasn't an accident that they perverted the words. It was done deliberately. They understood it was calculated, and they understood the results that it would have. And we find that it's the tactic of the enemy since the beginning. If you go all the way back in the Garden of Eden, what was the first thing he does? He doesn't come with an outright lie. That'd be too easy. Instead, he takes the word of Yahweh and he deliberately twists it and perverts it. And if you're not careful, you'll fall for that perversion. And we find that if Israel hasn't spent time learning the Debar, if Israel hasn't spent the time handling it, understanding it, allowing his word to be put in their mouth, then how are they going to be able to decipher the delusion? How are they going to be able to decipher the difference between the genuine and the fake? Will their own words expose them or cover them? And we find this is why it's so important. This is why you're hearing the word poured out at such a level that hasn't been seen since Yeshua walked the face of the earth. You need to know your covenant. You need to understand the word of Yahweh because you're about to have to deal with the enemy that set up camp in the house. And he's going to twist the words of the covenant. And if you're not careful, you're not going to be able to discern the difference. And you're going to get yourself caught into a heap of trouble. But if you can hear the difference and you can say, no, I know what the word says and it is written, then that's how you're going to deal with the situation and gain access back to your inheritance. <coughs> Amen. This term, Avon, is a cognate in Hebrew of the word Avon. Same room, different vowels. And it means to look askance, to eye with suspicion. Children, a lot of you probably get that look from your parents a lot. <laughs> to observe something with a critical and questioning attitude. It's interesting because this term Avon, dealing with something being twisted or perverted deliberately, is now connected with when that thing is twisted, when it's perverted, that if you can't discern that it's been twisted, you'll look at it with a critical and questioning attitude and we find that what's being related here is that if we can't discern between the truth of his word and the perversion of it, then it will cause us to begin to question and look with that critical eye at the promises that he's given us. It will cause us to begin to question our promises and our inheritance and our situations that we're going through instead of understanding Yahweh's in control, he's got this, we'll begin to look at that situation a little bit differently. That mountain will start, will start to grow. And now you can understand why Israel has to learn to deal with the sayers and their own words. It was going to affect the way they looked at their own situation, and therefore it was going to affect the outcome of the battle. And we see it with the first generation. They entered the promised land, and because they didn't understand, they weren't dealing with the words of their own mouth, when they come back, they bring an evil report, and the way the situation looks changes. They make the statement that there were grasshoppers, in the eyes of those giants. And yet Joshua and Caleb, who obviously could discern the difference, said, no, they're meat for us. Yahweh's with us. Who can be against us? And so we find that herein lies the, the dilemma then. Israel's words and later their actions have exposed them as not quite adhering to the terms of this covenant. In fact, we're reminded of it in this Torah portion. Just recently, you messed up with Baal Peor. Just recently, you stepped outside of the boundary lines, and now we find that the olive and Tob is situated here, and he's about to judge this situation of whether or not they should have access to that inheritance, of whether or not they can cross the Jordan River and actually make it across to the other side and not be swept down in the river of judgment. What will become of them? How can they cross in this condition? And to be, on to be honest, many of us, are in the same position. Our words have exposed us. Our words have not always been what they should have been. And now we find that we're about to go before the king and we've shirked our own responsibilities because we didn't deal with the words of our mouth. And now we're having to go and petition him to fix the mess that we ourselves allowed to be planted. 
So the question becomes, how can we do this? How can we petition him? What will become of it? And you'll find the answer is found once again in this phrase, by Canaan. Because in the middle of that root ethnon that meant the harlot's pay, the gain of a prostitute, in the middle of the olive tav nun nun is inserted the letter ket, va'et chanan, right in the middle of that root. The letter ket, as we said earlier, it represents a fence or a wall, but it's interesting because it's also the letter that was drawn in blood on the doorposts in Egypt. They drew the ket on the lintel and the doorpost, and it marked that that house was going to be redeemed. It's the eighth letter of the Hebrew alphabet, and the number eight is associated with new beginnings and also circumcision. And it's no accident that letter ket is the letter that is synonymous with the word kai, life. In other words, he's reminding them in this statement, va'et kanan, the picture that's being presented in that one statement was that the Messiah was willing to reiterate the terms of the wedding contract, and he understood and he knew Israel had played the harlot. They stepped outside of the boundary lines. They're in the house of Peor, the house where they're being exposed and uncovered. And yet he's reminding them that once again he's going to apply that ket to the doorpost of their heart. Once again, the ket is going to be written over them, and they're going to be delivered out of this house of bondage. And yet they're being reminded that if they want access to that life, that new beginning that's being promised to them, it's going to come with a price. Yes. There's going to have to be a circumcision of the house. If they want to experience this new beginning, if they want to come out of this house of bondage, if they want the cat written upon them, if they want to be marked as the one that's going to be redeemed, they're going to have to be willing to apply the circumcision to their heart and to their lips. And so we find it points not only to the Messiah that would be circumcised and cut off as the lamb to apply that blood to the doorpost to redeem them, but it was also pointing to the circumcision that would be required of you and I. The amazing thing about covenants is it's not a one-way street. It's not he does all the work and you get off scot-free and there's, you have no responsibilities. Instead, we find that a covenant means that each party has obligations. Each party has some expectations and some requirements. And we find that he's willing to give his life. He allows himself to be cut off to redeem you. And all you're expected to do is to a circumcision of the heart and to walk and stay within the boundary lines. And my goodness, when the boundary lines are all the promises that are good for you, and it's all about teaching you and instructing you of how to have a relationship with Him, how hard should it be to stay in these boundary lines and to walk it out when it's been laid out step by step for us? We find that the lintel and the doorposts of the house where the blood was applied, it was symbolic of the area of the loins. Just like with the temple, the pillars represented the loins of the man where the seed is housed and released. And so when they saw the blood being applied to the doors, to the doorposts of the house, it was literally a picture they were being given that there was a circumcision that was taking place on that house. And the seed that was going to be housed in that house and the seed that was going to be released was about to change. In other words, they were going to have to change the seed that they released from their mouth because their words would identify them and cause them to be set apart from the Amorites, from the Sayers. And so as Israel's preparing to cross the Jordan, it's all about teaching them there's a circumcision that's about to take place. You're going to have to change the words that are coming out of your mouth. Because if you go into the land and you begin to have to face those giants and try to deal with the enemy, if we haven't changed the words that are coming out of our mouth, then just like the first generation, we'll look at the situation wrong. And we'll find that it will cost us the battle. But if we walk in and we're a house that's circumcised, if we're a house that's speaking forth his word and we know that we can stand on his covenant promises, then no matter what the situation is, we'll be able to understand that we can speak to that mountain and that mountain is going to be moved. Yeah. Now in connection with this, we find that Moses is told to head up to the top of Pisgah because he's not going to be crossing the Jordan. Why? Let's look at this term, Pisgah. It's Strong's number 6449, and it means a cleft, 
a fragment, a part. It's from the root of pasag, which means to pass between or within, to cut up or to divide. And when I saw this, it's a term that reminds us of the way you cut a covenant. And we see it laid out with Abraham over 400 years earlier. Abraham cuts this particular style of a covenant. He takes the offerings of the animals and he cuts them in half and they're laid out. And then the process of this ancient covenant cutting process was that the two individuals, the two parties that were entering into covenant with one another would walk between the pieces and they would make the declaration that if I don't keep the terms of this covenant, then what happened to those offerings, what happened to those sacrifices, let that be done to me. It was a blood covenant. They understood the significance. They understood that these terms were to be kept. So when we see this Mount Pisgah, it's immediately painting the picture, reminding Israel, you're about to cross into this land, the inheritance, and it has everything to do with what happened 400 years earlier when Abraham cut this covenant with Yahweh, the covenant of the pieces. And in Genesis 15, we see Abram performing this ritual, and he's negotiating the terms of the covenant. The interesting thing, though, is that Abraham can't guarantee these covenant terms because he's a man in, of flesh. And on his own, he can't guarantee that this price is going to be paid, that these covenant terms are going to be met. And so we, we see that instead of Abram walking between these pieces, what happens? Yahweh puts Abram to sleep. Just like Moshe. Moshe goes up into Mount Pisgah and he enters into sleep. Moses is cut off. Abram's cut off. Adam's cut off. Each one because they can't walk between the pieces. And so we find that Abram's put into a deep sleep just like Moses is here. And instead, the smoking furnace and the burning lamp, which represents the Messiah, the menorah, the, the lamp of Yahweh, begins to walk between the pieces. And he agrees to keep the terms and pay the penalty if they're broken. Abram can't make that covenant and make those promises on his own. So instead, Yahweh puts Abram in a deep slumber, and the one that can guarantee these terms walks between the pieces. That when these covenant terms are broken, I'll be the one that becomes the offering. I'll be the one that allows the, what happened to those offerings to be me. And we find this same exact scenario begins to take place here in Deuteronomy chapter 3 when Moses is told to go up to Mount Pisgah. He makes a statement in the English, it reads, Deuteronomy 3.26, that Yahweh was wroth with me for your sakes. And it seems that, well, Yahweh's angry with Moses, therefore he's not going to enter into the land, and now let's move on, and it's going to be Joshua. But in the Hebrew, this statement says, Vayitavar, Yahweh, be Lemana King. The Hebrew word for wrath here is abar. It means to pass or to cross over. The interesting thing is this same word is used earlier, and it's used specifically to describe crossing over the Jordan. Yet here they choose to translate it as meaning angry. It's the same word in the Hebrew, though. So the Hebrew, when you break it down by yitabar, you have the vav, yod, tav prefix. The vav means and, yod means he will, and tav means they will. In other words, the Hebrew is literally breaking down to tell them that, and he will cross over, speaking of Yahweh, with you for your sakes. Hallelujah. In other words, it will be the Yod representing Yahweh and the Tav representing the children of Israel. You're going to cross over because he's with you. He's walking between the pieces on your behalf. So when Moshe makes his statement, What's literally happening is that he becomes the picture of the circumcision of the house that's necessary. One has to be cut off, and then he's being shown that it's okay, though, because he can't guarantee the terms of this covenant, but there's one that's going to cross between the pieces on their behalf. So just like with Abraham, once again, Yahweh himself is choosing to guarantee the covenant terms. And this is why immediately after Moses makes the statement, Yahweh's angry with me and I can't cross, Immediately, he brings up Joshua. Joshua's name in Hebrew was Yehoshua, the son of Nun, the son of life. He represented Yeshua, the Messiah, who would be the one to lead Israel into their inheritance, into their promises. The one that was capable of walking between the pieces and worthy enough to cut the terms of the contract. 
And we find that because Moses cannot in his own strength, just as Abraham was unable to, and just as we are unable to in our own strength, we're reminded there's still one that's going to walk between the pieces for you. And we find that because of his sacrifice and because of his willingness to commit to the terms of this covenant, that now you and I can have access to these covenantal rights and we're promised and guaranteed that Yahweh will hear you when you cry. And yet we find that the focus this whole time, as they're being reminded of this, is that the focus for you and I was that they would have to learn to declare it. They would have to learn to keep their end of the covenant. We find that when we look at when Abraham cuts this covenant, his job was to prepare the sacrifice. Israel's job at Mount Pisgah is to prepare the sacrifice, to stand before him with this offering being lifted up and crying out to him. The second thing Abram was responsible for was he was to shoo away the fowls of the air that would come down and try to steal those offerings and attempt to compromise that covenant pact that was about to be made. And we find the same obligations are hinted at here in this Torah portion. In Deuteronomy chapter 3, 29, the statement is made, so we abode in the valley over against Beth Peor. The statement, so we abode, comes from the root yeshav, and it means to dwell, to remain, to sit, or to abide. The interesting thing, though, is that it can have the sense of to lie and wait for something. In other words, a sense of anticipation. They're lying in wait, preparing for something. But if you look at the way this word is conjugated here in the Hebrew, it's ba nashiv. The root is nun shin bait. Noom sheen bait also forms the word which means to blow or to drive away by blowing. And it just so happens it's the same word used in Genesis chapter 15, verse 11, when Abram drove away the fowls of the air. And we find that in our minds so often we picture him physically swatting away at these fowls of the air. But that's not the case. That's not what it's saying. It deals with the way that he drove away these fowls these of the air. The ones that would come to attempt to destroy and steal him was by the words of his mouth. Yes. He began to declare the word of Yahweh, and the enemy had to flee. And because he did that, Yeshua begins to walk between the pieces on his behalf. And we find the same pictures presented for you and I today. If we begin to declare the word of Yahweh and make our stand and shoo away the fowls of the air, then once again, the olive top will walk between the pieces on your behalf. Is it possible that Israel is stationed here waiting to cross the Jordan to see if they're able to blow away the fowls of the air by the words of their mouth? To see if they've circumcised their lips and are speaking the word and are able to, by the words of their mouth, to shoo away the fowls and the enemy that would attempt to compromise and to steal from them? Do you think that maybe you're stationed at a certain location, wherever you may be, in your own personal situations, in your own lives, for the same purpose. That he's got you in this situation because it's a testing time. It's a time where he's looking and inspecting you and he's waiting to see if you can stand up and by the words of your mouth, by learning to declare the, your, the word of Yahweh, begin to shoo away the fowls of the air that would swoop down and attempt to destroy that word from you. To see just how tenacious you can be when it comes to the promises that Yahweh has for you. And I found that it's in the midst of these type of pitched battles that it becomes the most difficult to stand up and make these type of declarations. And yet that's what this whole Torah portion is reminding Israel concerning. He's trying to teach them. He's challenging them. He's literally laying down the gauntlet in the midst of all this adversity when it seems as if nothing is going right in every Thing is coming against you and the fowls of the air are swooping down on you and it seems if you don't have the strength to stand, can you stand up and declare the word of Yahweh in your situation? Isaiah chapter 55 verse 11, and this is what we're going to close with, tells us, So shall my word be that goeth forth out of my mouth. It shall not return unto me void, but it shall accomplish that which I please, and it shall prosper in the thing whereto I sent it. 
If you've got a promise from Yahweh, if you've got a sent word, he's made the declaration, he's not a man that he should lie, that that word is going to do what he's told it to do, and it's not going to return to him empty or void without accomplishing the task that he sent it to do in your life. The question is, are we willing to stand and make those declarations and believe that his word can do what his word said it will do? Amen? Amen. Amen.